Robert, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Hey, man. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Okay, so to kick it off, uh, I've heard you say many times that the question, what is money, is the most in question, important question in the world. Uh, what was the event or series of events that led you to that insight? Well, I've always been a curious kid and started reading a lot at a very young age at the behest of my mother, who I think was tired of answering all the questions I was bombarding her with. And my curiosity initially, it took me a lot of places when I was really young. I was curious about the cosmos and nature. Uh, I read a lot about physics and astrophysics and astronomy and things of that sort. Uh, a little bit later, I got really interested in into philosophy, mainly Eastern philosophy. Um, and then as I got into late high school, early college years, I was very interested in markets, economics, um, and in trying to understand economics, which really I was just mystified by the stock market initially. I could not understand what all the the uproar was about like people are trading these paper certificates i didn't really understand what it meant yet somehow it made the world go round so in trying to get my head around that i started reading the economist magazine initially which i would not recommend the writing is really good but it's in retrospect it's a lot of keynesian pseudoscience um, i started to read some economics newsletters and from one of these newsletters, I picked up a book recommendation for a book titled The Creature from Jekyll Island. And The Creature from Jekyll Island is a book about the inception of the Federal Reserve, which is the central bank in the United States. Uh, it's, a, it's about a history of central banking more broadly as well. And then it also goes into the nature of money itself. And that book... I think I read when I was like 19, 20 years old, brought me to the conclusion that broken money is the source of most problems in the world today. And at the time, again, this is probably 2004, 2005 timeframe, there was not really a solution to central banking. And I just sort of put it on a shelf. You know, I just said, hey, you know, this is, the problem in the world from my perspective if we could fix one thing in the world it would be to fix the money because the so many things in human experience are downstream from the money like if the money doesn't work then human society basically does not work and to get a very clear picture of this you could just look at conditions in any hyper and the conditions that pervade under any hyperinflationary regime, right? Anywhere the currency has collapsed and failed, you can see what people are doing. And they're basically living hand to mouth, you know, trust collapses, um, division of labor collapses, there's no wealth being produced, production processes collapse, you know, people are eating their pets, paper cash is clogging the gutters. Um, it's just terrible. It's as terrible of anything as you can possibly imagine. And so that book sort of set the stage for me that money is really the core problem in the world today, but there was no solution. And then several years later, it's 2016, 2017, I discovered Bitcoin. Initially was interested in, in crypto um, and eventually just bit by process of studying came to see that Bitcoin's the only crypto asset that matters. And that's something we can talk about later. And um, that was the, the aha moment for me when I saw that Bitcoin is the solution to the problem that central banking posed to the world. Um, that was the big light bulb for me. And I think that's why Bitcoiners are so adamant today when they say, you know, fix the money, fix the world, that it really is it's kind of this problem that's hidden in plain sight. You know, we know the value of free markets. We know the value of distributed problem solving. We know the, pro the, the value of innovation. It, yet we have stifled all of those things in the sphere of money, you know, in the name of, of monetary central planning, which is central banking. And in a way, I just think 
humans have not been able to get out of their own way prior to the invention of Bitcoin because the temptation to control money and manipulate it for one's own benefit at the expense of others is just the temptation is too great for human beings to resist. So that's it, you know, and then more, much more recently, November, 2020, I launched the podcast, the what is money show. And we explore this idea in depth. Uh, people often ask me, is it a finance podcast? And my answer is no, it's, uh, it's anything but that. Actually, we talk about, you know, technology, physics, philosophy, history, even metaphysics at times, um, how the human enterprise has been changed through technology, through ideas. We talk about the nature of language because there's many parallels between language and money. And um, it's a very cerebral kind of podcast. And uh, the central point of inquiry is what is money? And there are many, many answers to that question. It's kind of like asking one of these profound questions. What is truth? What is beauty? What is justice? And uh, it's been a hell of a journey. I get to talk to a lot of intelligent people, getting a lot of different perspectives on the nature of money and hopefully learning in the process and uh, learning in a way that my audience can come along for the ride. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's, it's a fantastic podcast. And, you know, the, the link for that's going to be in the show notes. Um, Robert, when you're, you know, talking to, you know, a, a layman or you're, you know, chatting about what is, was, what is money more, more casually with someone, is there like a, a particular fact or, or is there like, what's the most disturbing thing that you've, you've learned about how our current financial system works that was just, you know, shocking to you or particularly um, effective at, helping people to to realize that like we need to address this problem of of what is money. Well, one that jumps out to me as you're asking the question is just how often people mistake money for actual wealth. You know, everyone thinks they want more dollars, but you don't actually want more dollars. You want the things that dollars can buy you. And so economists call this purchasing power, right? This is the amount of purchasing that the money enables you to perform, right? How many cars or houses or pounds of beef can that money buy you? That is the purchasing power contained within the money. And so, you know, a million dollars used to be a lot of money. <laughs> used to really be a, a, a milestone for a lot of people to become a millionaire. Yeah. Well, the price of beef has tripled in the past three years in the United States. So if you had a million dollars three years ago, the purchasing power in terms of a million dollars has gone down by 67% in the past three years. Mm -hmm. So you could still have a million dollars today, but that million dollars will only buy you one third of the beef that it used to buy you. And so I call this a it's kind of like a cognitive optical illusion where people are so focused on the dollar, you know, getting more dollars in their bank account, in their brokerage statement, um, the, the nominal value of their assets, whether it's their house or, or art they might collect, you know, as long as the dollar value is going up, the nominal value, the notional value, they think things are okay. They think they're richer. They think they're better off. But this, this is an illusion, right? It's an illusion because it belies the truth that although the number of dollars in your accounts may be increasing, the purchasing power of each dollar is simultaneously decreasing. So it masks this transference of real wealth from those saving in dollars or dollar denominated assets to those who print new dollars, which are the shareholders of central banks and those that are politically connected or favored enough to get access to the newly printed money first. Um, for people that are interested in that phenomenon, they could Google the Cantillon effect, which was named after Richard Cantillon. Basically says, it's pretty obvious, when you print new money, 
those who get the newly printed money first and can spend it when it's at its maximal value before it enter, enters wider circulation and becomes depreciated benefit at the expense of those who receive the newly printed money later. Hayek analogized this to pouring honey in a jar, right? Like the honey sort of piles up in the middle at first. It's very viscous and then it slowly widens out. So that that purchasing power of newly printed money is still high, but then once it, as it enters broader circulation, um, the money, you know, there's more dollars chasing the same amount of goods and services. Therefore, the price of goods and services goes up. So if you were just holding dollars the whole time or living on fixed income, living paycheck to paycheck, et cetera, you're basically getting taxed or robbed by those who are getting the newly printed money first. So this is the big one, right? Like people are just duped by thinking getting more dollars is good and it's simply not enough. It's not enough. Yeah. Uh, and Alan Watts has a great quote on this. This is where, you know, there is a relation between money and language because the words we use to relate to things are not the things themselves, right? Obviously we need language to communicate about the world, but what did the ancient Taoists say? The, the finger that points out the moon is not the moon, right? Words are basically pointers to things or ideas or concepts. They're not the thing or the idea or the concept themselves. Alan Watts said, we have forgotten. What we have forgotten is that thoughts and words are conventions and that it is fatal to take conventions too seriously. A convention is a social convenience as, for example, money. But it is absurd to take money too seriously, to confuse it with real wealth. In somewhat the same way, thoughts, ideas, and words are quote-unquote coins for real things. So we are animals that use language, right? We're, as Aristotle said, we're the rational animal. And language is among our most important tools. And my argument uh, or a strong argument that's shared on the show is that money is equally as important as language, if mm. not more important. Uh, I actually think it predates language, uh, but has many of these linguistic qualities that human civilization simply cannot function without. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, my brother used to work in Cuba and uh, he said that on payday, the girl, like every store was the shelves were empty yeah. as, as soon as payday hit, uh, because people would rush into town and buy whatever they could, because yeah. they knew that the purchasing power of their their money, because every every round of paychecks, you know, was was being as you said, um, diluted by more printed money. They knew that yeah. on the next Monday they'd be able to buy less of the rice or the toothpaste or the, you know, the meat or the salt that they could have bought on, on the Friday. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it's in, in Weimar, Germany, when uh, the Reichmark was hyperinflating, people would go to the beer, uh, go to the bar on payday mm -hmm. and they would buy all the beer they were going to drink for the night at the beginning of the night <laughs> because the prices literally changed every few hours. Oh, wow. So prices on beer would go up every few hours. So this, wow. that same phenomenon, yeah. yeah, it holds at different durations, right? As the currency is depreciating more quickly, prices yeah. change more quickly and yeah. people become yeah. that much more desperate to spend the dollars before they depreciate. Yeah, exactly. And so like, you know, to, can you walk people through like some, like what would the, the current inflation rate be in like the, maybe the official and the unofficial inflation rate in say, you know, the United States or Canada or kind of most first, first world countries right now? Yeah, it's really difficult actually. And fundamentally it's impossible to name an actual inflation rate. And the reason is, is because inflation is as subjective as the individual buyer, right? It's what things are you looking to buy? How quickly are their prices changing? Uh -huh. The basket of those goods and services that is unique to each buyer basically is your own inflation coefficient. Yeah. So now the government would have you believe, 
and Mises basically proved that in his book, Human Action. He said that it's impossible to have a universal inflation metric for that very reason, right? It's as subjective as the process of valuation itself. Um, and this is a key point in economics, that value is subjective. Uh, people might think even life, certain life essential things, right? Like water might be intrinsically valuable, but run away from anyone that uses the term intrinsic value. It's simply economic nonsense. Uh, and to prove the point, I would ask you, you know, how much value does water have to a drowning man? You know, even water, even air, like all, nothing, no matter how essential it is, is valuable to everyone in every situation. It's just not possible. Value is, it's in how we respond to the conditions of our environment. It's it's, an, it's a matter of response, a matter of, of adaptation, and therefore it is subjective to each individual and their circumstances. Mm -hmm. Um and so uh, what was the original question? I'm sorry, I deviated. The, I wanted to dig into like the giving people some ideas of inflation rates. Cause I think, you know, when we talk about oh, yes. Weimar Republic and like, you know, the price of beer increasing every hour, people think, well, that can't happen here. Yeah. Um, Cause we're, we're comparing it to these extreme situations. But as you said, at the beginning of the podcast, you know, the price of beef has tripled in the past yeah. three years. Yeah. So exactly. So, to have an inflation rate is actually not possible for the reasons just described. Mm -hmm. However, it's very convenient for a governmental body to prescribe an inflation rate or say that, you know, CPI, the consumer purchase index, right? So this is a basket of goods and services that has been arbitrarily selected by the state. And they say, these are the things that individuals need to buy to survive, right? It's X percent this, Y percent that. And so long as they manage the price changes in that government selected basket of goods, then they are determining what is good or bad inflation. Yeah. Now, there's a number of problems with this. Um, first of all, again, it's not possible initially, but second of all, they are selecting what goes in and out of that basket of goods. And amazingly, that basket excludes volatile items such as food and energy. Now, if you just stop, if you just pause on that for a second and think that the metric intended to evaluate price volatility excludes, the calculation of that metric excludes volatile items, you can see how much of a scam this is. Right? Yeah. They're just basically yeah. handpicking whatever they want that's not changing in price or is going down in price so they can get to this target 2% inflation number, which is just total, utter nonsense, basically. Yeah. So there, the re, you know, so you can't really ask, what is the real inflation rate? The best proxy for this is just going to be the actual change in the money supply year over year. Yeah. Because this is the amount of currency that's being counterfeited now it's being legally counterfeited, but counterfeited nonetheless. Um, there, there's no economic distinction between you or I trying to counterfeit a US $100 bill. There's no economic distinction, distinction between that activity and what the Federal Reserve engages in called quantitative easing, right? Where the government creates new debt out of thin air and the central bank buys this new debt with newly printed dollars. So then the central bank and its shareholders are now being paid interest on newly paid dollars, on money they just created out of thin air. And now when money is created out of thin air, I would argue this is not technically money, it's currency. They're creating new units of currency out of thin air. That is, and as that currency in, enters wider circulation, everyone that's holding dollars in an account, these are dollar savers, they are being extorted effectively yeah. by those that are creating the new units of currency. So this is, this is the asymmetric system that we live in, right? There's one group of people that can print new units of currency, a small fraction of people. There's a vast uh, group of people that are forced to use that currency, literally via legal tender laws, right? You have to pay your taxes and dollars you must use it in settlement of all debts, public and private, private, or face legal ramifications, basically. So 
the rate at which the currency is counterfeited is the closest proxy you're going to get to inflation. And we have increased, um, I would specifically say it's M2. And again, these are still numbers coming out of the Federal Reserve, so they're not as reliable as you would like them to be. Ideally, you would have a universally transparent and auditable money that we could yeah. all know what the supply is at any given time. We would know what the supply is going to be. We would know what rules are being used to decide. Um, we would be free to switch out of the monetary system if it didn't suit our interests. So we could fork the system anytime we want. Yeah. Um, obviously, I'm alluding to Bitcoin here and its value uh, in comparison to fiat. But over the past, since 2020, we have increased USM2 over 40%. So we mentioned the price of beef has tripled while the general price level has roughly gone up 40%. Now you've seen this, it's disproportionate, right? Like assets have gone up more quickly than consumables, for instance, because what do people do in an inflationary environment? Well, the natural thing is to not save in the currency that's being counterfeited and instead save in something that cannot be counterfeited like commodities, real estate, equities, yeah. anything yeah. that can't be arbitrarily printed. And that's indeed what people do. There's also another effect too. You see global debt exploding relative to, to GDP. And this is because of the incentives associated with depreciating currency. We are all incentivized to borrow dollars today when they're stronger spend them to acquire things mm -hmm. and then pay back that debt over a, a term during which those dollars become weaker, right? Through inflation, right? So you're borrowing stronger dollars and paying back weaker dollars. This is why debt explodes when you depreciate currency in this way. So, I mean, I think those are just some good things to think about. It's we've, we've, inverted the entire idea of economics which is you know produce and save yeah and then consume the whole keynesian economic model is literally flips it on its head it's, if there's an economic crisis well then pump more liquidity in the system get people to consume more which will get producers to produce more and savings be damned basically yeah, yeah. and so we end up with this totally debt-ridden fragilized world um, and there's also, it also drives the, the gap between rich and poor more and more. So we, we're literally destroying the world through money printing. Yeah, absolutely. And it, you know, like you said, it's, it's really insidious how, like how well it works. Like I've, I've had many conversations with people who are aware of, you know, the government corruption and, you know, all these other things that are wrong with the world, but at the same time, those same people are clamoring for, you know, things like universal basic income or subsidies, government subsidies for their particular industry or, no. um, you know, various welfare programs. Yeah. Like that, that's all just the same process of inflation. That's right. And it's, it's the, like I saw a great uh, meme the other day, which was, you know, the, the value of your house hasn't gone up the purchasing power of your dollars has been going down. Exactly. Yeah. That's the illusion. And that's, yeah. you know, the simplest lesson in the world, I think. I mean, if if you could take away nothing else about money, it's just that. So when the nominal value of something goes up does not mean the value, like the real value of the thing went up, right? Yeah. This is the same thing as if we redefine the actual spatial dimensions of an inch or a foot or a meter right if i just make that smaller well then all of a sudden the square feet of my house goes up yeah in nominal terms right yeah. if, if, it's, if it's a 2000 square foot house and i increase it you know or reduce the definition of it what is it uh by a third then you can increase the size of your house by 50 percent nominal terms yeah but your actual house hasn't changed of course we've just changed what we call a square foot yeah. So it's the same thing, right? There's there's a specific supply of goods in the world. Mm -hmm. You can denominate that in one dollar, in a million dollars, in a trillion dollars. It doesn't matter. But change that the problem is when one group 
can produce new units of that instrument that can be used to obtain the goods. And another group doesn't get access to that money until much later, that currency until much later. Then you get this asymmetric transfer of wealth, basically from the poor to the rich. This is the anti Robin Hood, right? Yeah. This is stealing from the poor, giving to the rich. And that's why central banking is, in my estimation, inherently evil and inherently destructive to social cohesion and human economization. Yeah. So taking this this idea of, of inflation and, and the other the other problems of, of our current fiat money system, I've heard you say many times that, you know, when you corrupt money, it corrupts everything in the society. Can you talk mm -hmm. about some of the kind of the snowballing effect or the the moral ramifications of what happens when, you know, money printer goes burr? Yeah. Um, well, I guess well, we mentioned this sort of earlier, but how people are always looking for another government handout, government subsidy, you know, is, there's a weird thing here because basically everyone is looking to gain something for nothing, as I often say on the show. Mm -hmm. And so you might be very favorable to a money printer if you're one of the insiders, right? It's a great business. You literally yeah. can't lose. You just, no matter what's happening in the economy, doesn't matter what the conditions are, you're literally printing money. You never take a loss. A central bank, if you, we could look at a central bank's actual profit and loss statement, these Businesses are not audited. They do not disclose anything. They're private institutions. As we joke with the Federal Reserve, it's not federal and it has no reserves, right? <laughs> it's as federal as Federal Express and it has no reserves. If you could see the P&L of these organizations, you would see a business that's profitable in perpetuity. You're literally printing money. Imagine if your business could print money. Would you ever incur a loss in your business if you could print money? Like, no, it's not possible. So long as there's enough idiots willing to accept your money, then you'll never incur a loss. So um, there's basically this idea, you know, this idea at the heart of Western civilization. And it's, this goes all the way back to the year 1215 when King John signed the Magna Carta. And the ideal was life, liberty, inviolable property, right? Property, like individuals able to own things that other individuals have no right to take and that ideal of people being able to keep the things they earn right and be free to trade amongst themselves is what supports a free market that a free market in which people can actually discover the best solutions right the, the fastest cheapest best ways to solve problems for one another um it's the way new innovations come to the fore right someone figures out hey i can do instead of using animals to move this plow we can use a steam engine right and all of a sudden you can increase human productivity through technological advancement and then those ideas spread around the world through imitation um this idea is what this is what Mises said that if, if history could teach us anything, it's that private property is inextricably linked to civilization. Like we basically have one of two ways of resolving disputes over scarce resources, which is a fight we're always going to be in, right? We're mortal, we're finite in terms of time, in terms of ability terms of energy we're living in a world that only offers us so much right there's there's competition over resources to survive well we can either kill each other over every sandwich or we can have private property and the rule of law and we can resolve our disputes over every sandwich and everything else in a non-violent rational way so if you, and this is just, I mean, this is just, this is it, right? You're not going to have civilization without private property. I mean, you can almost say the point of civilization is to enforce private property, right? That's what the rule of law is. Property is nine, you know, you often hear possession is nine tenths of the law, but if you really boil it down, 
private property is 10 tenths of the law. There's no instance where the law does anything else other than enforce protection of you, your body and your property. And if can, we consider here that you own yourself, so basically your body is your property, right? That's an inalienable form of private property that only you control yourself, only you can own yourself. You can't even give away, can't give yourself away to someone because you always, if you changed your mind, well, you still own yourself, right? Mm -hmm. So private property is very important. We talk about this a lot on the show. Printing money is only a violation of private property. It is nothing else. Now, it is sold to people as some type of remedy to economic issues due to that cognitive optical illusion I mentioned earlier, right? If you only think one order deep and you say, oh, we're in an economic recession, people are desperate for money. There's not enough money circulating. People aren't buying, you know, spending, investing enough. How do we solve this? Well, someone that, you know, is ignorant of economics and doesn't think more than one level deep might say, oh, let's just print new money. Let's just create some new money, right? And give it to the people that don't have money. And there you go. We don't have enough money. Let's print more money. Everyone has enough money. And we're, we're off to the races again. But this, again, is just like saying, oh, my house isn't big enough. What are we going to do? Mm -hmm. Well, I got an idea. Let's redefine square foot. You know, let's just make it smaller and make the house bigger. And that'll be that. Why 2,000 square foot house is a 3,000 square foot house and everyone's happy. It's like you haven't changed anything in reality. Yeah. And this is basic. Just apply your intuition for one second. Mm -hmm. Does anyone in the world actually believe that printing new units of paper can put food in people's mouths? can put roofs over people's head, can put cars in people's driveways. Like, no, all production requires work. You can't just magically press a button. You can't press print new dollars and cars or houses or food appears, obviously. Yet, again, we operate under this Keynesian illusion that that is possible. So private property being the central pillar to civilization itself and the printing of money being the most widespread way to violate private property and in a way that lets the state deny it and blame it on others, right? I just saw, it is so clown world. I just saw this video of Joe Biden. Uh, this is a Super Bowl commercial. Yeah, I saw it too. And he's saying, you know what? Prices of snacks were like, if you're like me in the big game, you like to have a nice snack. But you might have noticed the prices of snacks have gone up the past few years, especially ice cream. I love ice cream so much. And the price of ice cream has gone up, blah, blah, blah. And my administration is calling on all of these producers that are increasing their prices to stop. Stop this price increasing. It's like, are you fucking kidding me? Yeah. Are you really going to sit there and call out? hardworking producers that compete amongst themselves to offer consumers the best possible satisfaction of consumer wants at the best possible prices because they're competing with one another, right? They're always competing for market share. So they need to either deliver a product that's higher quality or deliver a product that's at a lower cost. That's how they attract market share. That is a like a self-regulating process that constantly pushes out new, better, and more products, right? That is fantastic. And by the way, prices would tend to go down in a free market because as we get smarter, as we become more technologically sophisticated, as we accumulate more capital goods, which let us amplify the returns on human labor, then we can produce things faster, better, cheaper, right? So, and when you say produce things faster, better, cheaper, that's equivalent to saying price go down. Yeah. Right. This is the point of technology. This is the point of the free market. It's, you know, to make it very obvious, you're going to produce a lot more apples per man hour when you have an apple picking machine yeah. rather than one guy out there picking apples by hand. Right. So obviously the price per apple in terms of human time goes down when you have a machine that increases productivity. Right. There's nothing about free market competition that increases prices. No. Like, of course, you have aberrations here and there, right? There might be a shortage. Uh, maybe there was a, a drought 
and apples, you know, an apple crop failed. So the prices of apples went up for a season. But when the price of apples goes up for a season, again, the free market heals this wound naturally. Because when the prices of apples go up, you're doing two things. You're incentivizing producers, agriculturalists, to produce more apples because they sell at a higher price. Simultaneously, on the other side of the market, you're incentivizing consumers to eat less apples or eat something else. All right, so this resolves the problem. It's a self-resolving thing. So for Joe Biden to come on TV and say, you know what, you producers, stop increasing your prices yeah. and not mention one thing about the $8 trillion US dollars that have been counterfeited over the past four years yeah. is asinine. I mean, the, yeah. the tweet that I put out about this said that this is like mentioning, uh, not mentioning lack of oxygen as a cause of death for a drowned man. Yeah. Like when you're going to get on TV and talk about the problems of inflation, but not mention the counterfeiting of $8 trillion, you're literally, you're not, you're not even stating the, the sole problem. It's the only problem that caused it. So the point of all this is due to people's ignorance about money, about economics, about inflation, about private property, the government can get away with the shit. He runs a Super Bowl commercial. A Super Bowl commercial. Yeah. Blaming price increases on producers. And people are like, yeah, fuck those guys. Fuck yeah. those ice cream makers, those greedy capitalists. Yeah. I think and, the level well, get- it's just, it, you know, you can just, it's, it's incredible. And it's just because of this failure to understand the nature of money. So, so yeah. back to your much earlier question why is this such an important question? I was like, well, if people had, in general had like sort of answered that question for themselves, that would not work. Like you couldn't oh. run that commercial on TV, right? There'd be tomorrow, it'd be like going on TV being like, the sky is red, everyone. People would yeah. like wake up tomorrow morning like, no, it's not, Joe. Like, what are you talking about? Yeah, yeah. So, no, it's to- total gaslighting. Yeah. And, but the, like the, the, how well it works, I'm just shocked by it. Like, for example, like right after that, it was like two days after after the Super Bowl. I'm in a couple of Bitcoin groups, um, you know, here in Canada, and uh, there's a, there's an artist in Toronto who's started this campaign where he's he's created these T-shirts. Um, do you guys have the grocery store Loblaws? We in don't America. So it's it's a chain here. It'd be like Walmart or something. Yeah. But um, he's he's created these T-shirts that say Rob Laws. Oh my gosh. And um you know, because the, basically the price oh of gosh. groceries is going so high. So someone in this, like this Bitcoin only group literally wow. posted it saying, Hey guys, because now Loblaws is trying to sue this guy because they, he's, he's basically taken their logo and just changed yeah. the name on it. Yeah. They're trying to sue him. Um, so someone in the Bitcoin group was like, Hey, do, do does anyone in the, the Bitcoin community know of any solutions like sensor, sensor proof payment solutions that we could help this guy out with? Oh so that God. that he can continue to sell his t-shirts <laughs> and oh it was just like yeah me and one other guy were like that's worse than joe's super bowl commercial about inflation oh like this has nothing gosh. to do with the grocery store and yeah so I, the the this is something really important that people need to get their heads around is that it is not it's not the grocery store it's not the mechanics it's not right. the producers of the world and when we start turning on each other like that that's when shit yes. gets bad Dude, absolutely. That's actually very discouraging to hear that. I'm sorry yeah. to yeah. hear that among within a Bitcoin group because it's people falling for the bait, man. It's like yeah. we are. Yeah. The other well, thing Aristotle said about humans, we are the political animal. Yeah. So we are the rational animal, but we're also this political animal. And somehow you can short circuit people's rationality by pushing politics on them. And that's exactly what that sounds like to me. Yeah. It's like, yeah. Well, and, and which, which makes me think that like, is this an inside job? Like, cause here yeah. it is, like, here's this, this struggling artist who's, who's like going, you know, kind of the David and Goliath story yeah. and they're like trying to paint it as this underdog. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so in my mind, it's stuff like that. That's actually mo- more dangerous than, yes. than, you know, Biden's uh, probably what $10 million Super Bowl <laughs> commercial. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, what's 10 million bucks when you can print it out of Exactly, air? yeah, yeah. This, this reminds me, too, of the old saying that the state is the great fiction by which one group of people try to live at the expense of another group of people. Yeah. So, that again, if it's if you can get in that position of taking 
well, then you will say and do whatever you can, right? You'll, you'll, you'll lie. You'll, you'll create entire ideologies, right? Yeah. Keynesian economics is an entire pseudoscientific ideology that just is intended to justify the government control of currency, basically. Yeah. Mar Marxism, right? From each according to their ability to each according to their need. It's just this insane nonsense that's intended to say you own nothing and the state owns everything. Right. Yeah. It's just a very elaborate romantic lie that is a cover story for, for the world's greatest theft. And so yeah. that the because the state is is engaged in systematic stealing, it constantly needs to engage in systematic deception to justify that stealing and sell it to its mm -hmm. victims as if it's good for them. Yeah. Right. This is the whole inflation is good for the economy. This is the whole, oh, look at Joe wagging his finger at the, the free market telling him to be better and not raise prices. Like, So the state basically wages war on human rationality in order to keep it politicized, keep people divided amongst themselves, and keep conflicts in the sphere of physical force, right? You don't want people resolving their disputes nonviolently and rationally because if they do that then there's no need for a state right the state is the monopoly on violence you need people class clashing in the physical space so the state can have some uh some justification for its existence and so i you know this we could go into this i won't go into this now unless you would <laughs> like to but wokeism right this whole oh yeah what is, yeah, a, yeah what is a woman this is all an attack on definitions this is yeah, all yeah. an attack on human rationality socrates said the beginning of wisdom is the definition of terms right if you yes. cannot if you and i cannot establish social consensus on basic terms then we have an inability to communicate rationally if yeah. we cannot communicate rationally then things degenerate to physical conflict right this is the purpose of free speech so that our ideas and thoughts can go to battle and die so that our bodies do not have to. Yeah. If the state can diffuse free speech, then it can force people into physical combat. And that is the domain where the state shines by yeah. definition as the yeah. monopoly on force. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's super important. And, and I think like particularly folks in, in kind of my, you know, my demographic, my community, which is, you know, homesteaders, farmers, um, you know, we, we tend to be quite, you know, practical, just kind of hands-on people. And so we've kind of um, poo-pooed this idea that like, that ideas matter, you know, like the, yeah. that, the, the, the statement that you, you said before, like Marx is, you know, from each according to their ability to each according to their needs, mm -hmm. that idea has killed more people than probably That's any right. other idea. Right. And it's an idea. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and, and I think, you know, inflation as an idea, as a concept, is is probably on par with, um, or actually, it, it might even be more than that. Because without without inflation, Marx and all the communists would have had nothing to pay their soldiers with to go to war. One hundred percent. Yeah. This, by the way, just on Marxism, Marx's eighteen forty eight manifesto to the Communist Party, plank number five or measure number five reads: a central state. An, an exclusive central state monopoly on cash and credit. Yeah. The central bank is a Marxist institution. Yeah. It is literally straight out of the playbook. So we have, yeah. have Marxist money everywhere in the world today. So anywhere that you may hear people espouse, oh, well, not here, not here in the West, yeah. not here in the US, Canada, we're free market capitalists, blah, blah, blah. Well, let me ask you this. What's one half of every transaction? The answer is money. Well, guess what? Your money is socialist and or Marxist, mm -hmm. right? You don't have full private property rights in your money. Ask the Canadian uh, truck protesters yeah. if they had full private property in their money. Mm -hmm. Ask the contributors to that protest if they had full private property rights in their money. This money can be instantly and arbitrarily seized, frozen, reversed. It's not private and it's not property. No. Right. If it's not under the full control of the user, then it's not property. If it's not, if it can be surveyed and tracked, then it's not private. Yeah. So we don't have private property and money. Money is one half of every transaction. At best, any economy in the world that has a central bank is one half free market, one half Marxist. Yeah. A hundred percent, man. And so I think we've, I think we've hammered down, you know, the, the problem that we're facing and the implications of, of, you know, this, this fiat central bank monetary system, which 
I know we've been talking a lot about the, you know, uh, the U.S.'s financial system, but it's the same everywhere in the world. That's right. Uh, and so let's let's dive into some solutions now, because, you know, if, up until uh, up until just a few you know years ago, this it, it would appear that there was no hope. But no. now there there is a solution. And, uh, and so I, I want to dig into that as th this idea of of um, or how Bitcoin um, can be a solution in this regard. And I want to stress here, Bitcoin, not any other cryptocurrencies. Yeah. But by by way of kind of working our, our ourselves up to to Bitcoin, I wanted to just quickly touch on some of the the kind of base principles of like what's the function of money in a community. Like what? Like why? Why not? Um, like what are the limitations of of things like barter? What, why does something like money arise naturally in the evolution of a community? Yeah, sure. So, I think the best thing to read on this is uh, Carl Minger's on the origins of money. Okay, and he basically describes that you know anywhere humans have cohabitated, there has been trade. Right, that's we've always traded with one another, um, and, and the emergence of money, very simply, is just whatever <laughs> asset becomes most tradable within any community or any group of people. Um, it really is that simple, right? That everything, when you have an economy, every asset has a trading pair against every other asset but something is always going to be more tradable than other things, right? For instance, water, again, that's something that's very essential for life. That will tend to be accepted in trade by most people because, well, people need to drink water to survive. Mm -hmm. But a super niche product that most people, you know, might not be into. I always like the example of, um, you know, a green telescope, you know, but there's, Pretty, pretty niche, you know, there's probably not huge demand for green telescopes. So you're only a few people are going to trade whatever you have to offer for green telescopes. You get this liquidity stack, basically, where the assets like water, like food, things that are very universally demanded, they tend to be uh, more tradable than things that are more niche, right? Like the, like the green telescope. So as this liquidity stack sorts itself out within any trading economy, there is always, it's a stack, right? There's always something on top of the stack. There's some asset that is most tradable. That most tradable asset is money. It's just the universal medium of exchange, um, the most liquid asset in an economy. And it, it becomes, the reason it gets this designation medium of exchange is because once everyone identifies that this thing is tradable for basically everything else, or at least mostly everything else, then if I have green telescopes, the easiest way for me to get from green telescopes to chicken, if that's what I want, is to trade the green telescopes for money and then trade the money for chicken because mm -hmm. money is the universally demanded asset. Yeah. So once that top asset becomes designated as like the most liquid thing, then everyone prefers to trade what they have for it. Because once you have that, you can have anything else you want. It's the least hops, mm -hmm. right? The least number of trades from what you have to what you want. So money serves that purpose in any trading economy. And notice this description of how money emerges is independent of the state or government. This has nothing to do with the state. Uh, gold has been money long before there has been a state. Uh, people have been trading long before there has been a state. So that's very important because most, I think when you go onto the streets today and you poll the audience and you say, what is money? Most people will say something about government paper, right? They'll say, oh, it's this little sheet of paper in my pocket or these, this account um, on online that the government approves this thing you know they think the government is somehow uh, an inherent participant in money and it's just simply not the case government has just monopolized money they've they've yeah. imposed a control structure on top of a free market phenomenon and so that's again minger's description of how money emerges and now the pathway by which it emerges 
tends to go, this is going to be from uh, economist William Jevons, who described the emergence of gold. He said that it goes through these different phases. And at each phase, the money basically serves a different function. So when it came to gold, initially, people just collected it as, you know, it's, it's, it's shiny, right? It's got a, a yellow metallic brilliance. You can adorn yourself with it. It's very malleable, so you can shape it to make jewelry pretty easily. Uh, relatively indestructible, so it's very long-lasting. So initially, people just used gold as a collectible, effectively. But as it turns out, gold is also very rare. So as people started to collect it, that created a source of demand for gold. And then over time, as other goods and services increased in quantity relative to gold, because gold is so rare, the purchasing power of gold goes up, right? Because it's harder to obtain gold than it is chickens or water or food, right? Especially as these economies become more advanced, more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. So over time, gold shifts from being a collectible into being what's called a store of value, something that you can hold excess economic energy in, right? Savings, you know, like a savings account, basically. That's what the store value function is. And then eventually, as gold starts to store enough value, people eventually, it becomes that most tradable asset, right? It's It's got so much value in it, people will trade it for uh, anything else, right? So it actually rises to the top of that liquidity stack and becomes a medium of exchange. People will use gold to denominate their tra transactions in, right? So gold actually becomes money at that point when it becomes a medium of exchange by most definitions. And then finally, when that when gold is being traded widely enough and most enough people accept it, eventually people start to communicate in terms of gold. You will price things in terms of gold. And indeed, all most modern currencies, right? The dollar, the lira, the pound, these the reason they have all of these names of the currency, they're based in weighting metrics, right? Like the pound is an obvious one. The lira mm -hmm. is another one. Even dollar has something to do with weight. It's because the paper certificate represented a specific weight of the monetary metal. That's mm -hmm. what it was. It was a receipt. Exactly. So people, after the money is being used widely enough as a medium of exchange, people will eventually start to talk about prices in terms of the money. Mm -hmm. They'll negotiate in terms of the money. They'll perform economic calculation in their own mind and their own businesses between other parties in terms of the money. And they will execute trades in terms of the money. So it becomes the de facto unit of account and accountancy and accounting. Yeah. Right. It's a, it, this is where money becomes linguistic, right? It, you actually develop a pricing system based on the money itself. And the yeah. pricing system is extremely important. <laughs> for the global economy. This is what coordinates, as we talked about apples earlier, right? It's, you don't need to know about the drought. You don't need to know anything about it. You just need to know the price of apples went up. And yeah. as a producer, I know I should produce more because it'll make me richer. As a consumer, I know I should consume less because that'll keep me richer, All right? So it's this very powerful means of data compression that you don't need to hear anyone's story. It's compressing all the stories in the world into one number that everyone can act upon with, with a high degree of certainty. Yeah, and so it, the pricing system is responsible for coordinating more human action than I think any other economic signal, any other signal in the world, right? As we say, talk is cheap. Yeah, yeah. Right? You can say a lot of things, but when you put your money where your mouth is, all of a sudden, that's a much higher signal message, right? So the pricing system is this high signal messaging system that coordinates human action at scale. And yeah. all of this is facilitated through money. But to answer your question, those are the three functions. Money yeah. needs to store value, which means it needs to hold its purchasing power across time, at least maintain it, ideally go up, right? If, if the economy is becoming more productive mm -hmm. and I'm holding a share of money, well, then I would want to participate in that economy's growth, right? And this is what gold's done, right? Is the, the old saying here is an ounce of gold has been uh, enough money to purchase a fine man's suit for like over a century, right? Yeah. So number like fine suits in terms of gold, the price has basically remained flat 
Now, if you price a fine man's suit in terms of dollars over the past 100 years, it's probably gone from $40 to 4,000. You know, it's, it's done a hundred X. So that's the store value, something that holds its purchasing power or slightly participates in the economic growth as the economy becomes more advanced. The medium of exchange is that, again, the top of the liquidity stack that people can trade into and out of this thing very seamlessly so they can have the least number of jumps from what they have to what they want. And then the final function that money provides is that unit of account that we can actually think in terms of dollars. We can talk in terms of dollars. We can look at our net worth in terms of dollars, right? And we can compare these things to each other, other businesses, other assets, et cetera. Yeah. Just as you're talking there, it hit me that like those three, like without money, in a, even no matter what size community you're in, you'd have, you'd basically be like deaf, dumb, and blind because you wouldn't be able to communicate. Yep. Yep. Um, and, and, and as a result of that lack of communication, there'd be no exchange and there'd be no way to store for tomorrow. So you'd, you'd yes. basically just be living day to day. Um, and I think we, we touched on this, you know, on our first meeting, which is like, without money, there is no civilization. Like, That's right. Period. <laughs> yes. Bingo. Yeah. There's a great quote you just reminded me of. Money is like a sixth sense without which you cannot make a complete use of the other five. <laughs> yeah. It is. Yeah. It's, it's not an analogy or an exaggeration to yeah. say that we're actually interconnecting our minds through money, right? Just through yeah. the pricing system. It's where many minds become one in the pricing system, yeah. just like we do with language, by the way, right? Like if someone writes an incredible book and we all read the book, right? A lot of people, Atlas Shrugged, for instance, I don't know who's read that one, but oh yeah, <laughs> there's a whole society built around that book, right? There's literally multiple foundations and groups of people that have come together under the set of ideas contained in that book. And mm -hmm. they've become, you know, they've connected their minds and their, their bodies together through the book. The pricing system is doing the same thing. It's just a different type of information. You're getting this, this economic information about how much sacrifice is necessary to produce a thing. Right. And that's coordinating everyone around it, the producers and the yeah. consumers. So yeah, it is, yeah. it is indispensable to civilization to say the least. Yeah, it's it's huge, and and I think this is why, like, as you you know, you say so much that the, the question "what is money" is just so important, and I think so many people, including myself, take it for granted. But when you really start digging into it, like it, this is a profound, you know, life altering, society altering concept that we all need to wrap our heads around. Yeah, <clears throat> I think so. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so we're we're um, I think now we we can dive into. Um, you know, the, some examples of money and, and, and where we can touch on, you know, the limitations of barter and cash and precious metals, uh, even other cryptocurrencies. And then of course, you know, Bitcoin through the lens of um, one of the things I, I one of your, uh, your, your favorite concepts I've, I've, um, I've come across is you talk about the, the, the five properties that a money must have in order mm -hmm. to achieve those functions of store value, medium of exchange and unit of account. And those five are that money must be durable, must be divisible, it must be scarce, it must be portable, and it must be recognizable. So could you kind of, yeah, give some examples and talk about some of the other types of money that have been used, where they fall short, um, and, and and start to bring in the brilliance of Bitcoin and why it just knocks those five out of the park? Yeah, so... This is, I think, one of the most important answers to the question, what is money? Because you're actually looking at the services that money renders to a user. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, we call this the properties of money, right? If I'm going to describe a rock to you, right? I'm going to describe the properties of the rock to you, right? It's hard. It's jagged. It's gray. It's dense. You know, yeah. like it. It it's, makes a loud sound when I drop it, right? I'm describing how I interface with the thing, like what it does. If I throw it at a window, it breaks the window, right? That's a service the rock can basically render to me because I can't do that without the rock. Mm -hmm. And when you look at economic demand, like what people really want, it's all about services. It's not actually about the physical thing. And this is a little bit counterintuitive, but... The example I like to use here is a car, right? Like um, I, I own a nice F-350 turbo diesel 
custom built tank beast like <laughs> a joke that if batman had a truck it would look like my truck you know and it's fantastic it, it's yeah. physically an amazing thing i, I think it looks great etc yeah. but i don't actually want the truck right <laughs> i want to be able to go from a to b in a, a large machine yeah. that gets good gas mileage for what it is a machine that can tow anything in the world a machine that's got a 12,000 pound winch on the front of it so I can pull the truck out of something if it gets stuck. Um, there's a status symbol element to it, right? So to drive a big truck is like a social status thing. So it's all of these services that are associated with the good. Those are the things that I actually want. It's not about, it's never actually about the good. So when it comes to money, again, it's not the actual money. It's what services is this thing rendering to me as a user? And the reason this is such an important question is because it tells you, it gives you a strong indication of what people will choose as money, right? And mm -hmm. again, this applies to any technology. You could have seen something like the smartphone becoming dominant if you thought in these terms, right? If you just compared, okay, the landline what do people want when they communicate with a phone, right? They want freedom of communication to be able to access one another at any time, any place and communicate. Yeah. Okay. Well, the landline is stuck, right? It's stuck to a wall somewhere. So you, you give up a lot of freedom. You can't move around that much. If you compare that to a cell phone, well, the cell phone's mobile. It can move around anywhere. So in terms of the properties people want from a communication system, the mobile phone is clearly superior to the land phone because you can be anywhere and communicate from anywhere. So just thinking through that lens on things, it, make, it becomes more obvious what technology will become dominant. Mm -hmm. So when you look at money, and before, before I go into these, actually, I'm not going to go into the properties. I'm just going to mention where there's some failings. Yeah. So, but I'll give a definition first that I think is useful and a, a framing for this. Another really good answer so in addition to these five properties, which is a great answer for money, there's another answer I think that's very important. Money is a tool for moving economic value across space and time. Yeah. Right? Gold is fantastic for moving economic value across time. Yeah. Right? As we said earlier, it's something that holds its purchasing power. It has a relatively scarce supply so that as the output of goods and services in the world goes up, but the supply of gold goes up more slowly, that gold becomes more precious and therefore has more purchasing power. It, it, it lays claim to more goods and services. However, gold is not so great at moving economic value across space. It's not bad, right? We can fashion it into coins and bars and we can move it about um, with some degree of risk, you know, like you have to keep it secure and people can take it from you. Um, you can bury it in your backyard, but th that's kind of a hassle. You got to, you know, dig it up and bury it. And if someone finds it with a metal detector, then you're screwed. Um, so what did we do with gold? Because it wasn't so good at moving value across space is like, well, we figured out if we just put it all in one place called a bank and the bank gives us a redemption certificate for that gold called a bank note, then we can just trade this paper as if it's as good as gold. And it is as good as gold. So long as the bank keeps its promise to keep the bank, to keep the gold in reserve and to not over issue the paper, which is another issue. Yeah. Um, so that works, right? It's, it's um, we had a great money for moving value across time and gold, but not space, but we augmented its ability to move value across space by introducing the gold backed currency. And a gold backed currency functions really well as money, right? You have, again, the scarcity property of gold, giving it uh, the store value across time, the scarcity and the durability, and you've augmented the portability so that you have um, the ability to move economic value across space in, in transacting with, with others. Now, the problem, of course, with a gold-backed currency is that you've introduced the man in the middle. You yeah. now have to trust the middleman who is the banker to not either abscond with the gold or what's more common to run what's called a fractional reserve. So if he has 10 kilograms of gold on deposit in his safe, 
and he's issued 10 kilograms worth of redemption certificates worth of bank notes, that's a full reserve bank, right? His assets match his liabilities. Assets are gold and vault. Liabilities are these bank notes that he has circulating with his customers. They can come and redeem. They have a, a on-demand liability with the bank, right? The bank has to honor that that um, token when they say, hey, here's my one kilogram worth of bank notes. Give me the gold. Give me the metal. The bank has to be able to honor that. So when they have 10 kilos in the vault and 10 kilos in liabilities or bank notes circulating, assets match liabilities. It's a solvent business. Mm -hmm. However, the incentive to just increase, to just add more paper into circulation is gigantic. Because not only can you lend this paper at interest, you could also spend this paper at full value. As we said earlier, when the, the newly those who receive the newly printed money first, you're basically giving yourself the newly printed money first if you just issue this additional liability. And then so long as none of your customers or so long as a sufficient proportion of your customers don't come to redeem it all at once, you can get away with it. Yeah. Basically, so say you just over issue ten percent, right? You've got ten kilograms in the vault, and you've issued eleven kilograms worth of banknotes. So long as ninety percent of your customers don't come in on the same day and try to redeem the gold, then you're good, right? You can you can keep the scam going. Now, if you issue fifty percent more, well, then it, only fifty percent of your customers can come in any one day, and then your the the fraud is exposed. This is a bank run, by the way. Anyone who's yeah. ever seen the movie A Wonderful Life, a bank run <laughs> is only possible when a bank is fractionally reserved, when it's running a fraud in this way. If it's a full reserve bank and you've got ten ten in the vault and ten circulating, and a hundred percent of your customers come to redeem, you're fine, uh -huh. right? You've got you've got all your liabilities matched to assets, so you're good. So this is the problem basically is like you can't trust people to custody other people's money. You introduce what's called an agency problem. And that's when an individual is supposed to act in your best interest, but it is in their best interest to act against your best interest. People being self-interested yeah. political animals, you could maybe even argue rational animals in this way, like, short-term rational, they will decide to do what is in their individual best interest, even at the expense of their long run, uh, the, the long run not being in their best interest effectively. And so this is, this gives way to the scam that is fractional reserve banking. And basically that's what we've had, right? Gold was the best tool. It was the most to sort of sum up the history of monetary competition, you could say we've tried a lot of things across time. Yep. It was eventually determined through this long sequence of experimentation that monetary metals were the most durable, divisible, recognizable, and portable forms of money we had in the world. And of all the monetary metals, gold exhibited the greatest scarcity, which means the yep. most inflexible supply, right? It's the yep. hardest commodity to debase. And that's why gold became money. But because gold lacked in terms of portability, we needed to centralize its custody in a bank and issue a gold-backed currency on top of it. That introduced this man-in-the-middle problem, this agency problem. And that is what gives rise to fractional reserve banking, which is a scam that tends to get run until it breaks. And then you get into zero reserve banking, which is fiat currency. Fiat currency is just money because the government says so. Yeah. Like you'll you'll use this money or else we'll we'll hurt you. Yeah. And so that is, and I'm obviously glossing over a lot here, but that's been yeah. basically the sequence when evaluated through the lens of the properties of money. And it's obvious, you know, again, we called these services earlier. It's pretty obvious, right? You want a money that's durable. Well, you don't want your money to rot. You put money in a safe if you use oranges as money and it just rotted in the safe that's not very useful okay so that's not a good service i want a metal something that holds its character over time yeah. it needs to be divisible so that i can transact at different scales right i want to be able to buy coffee as easily as i can buy a house yep. it needs to be portable so i can move it across space right that was the shortcoming of gold that's why we needed currency it needs to be recognizable which means 
parties to a transaction need to be able to tell it is what you say it is, right? You, we've heard the term, probably heard the term sound money. Uh -huh. This actually relates to what a gold coin sounded like when dropped from a certain height. It had, it had a certain resonance. Yeah. And that was an, this was a heuristic used to determine its authenticity. They also used, uh, they used to do what's called a saying gold. So they'd actually test it. Do, doing different chemical techniques and whatnot to measure the authenticity of the gold. This was all to make sure it wasn't counterfeit, basically. And then finally, one of money that's scarce, which basically holds its purchasing power across time. Now, just as one last button on this, and I'll throw it back over to you. This is why, like that whole framing mm -hmm. explains perfectly to me why Bitcoin is such a profound innovation. Yeah. Okay, money is a tool for moving value across time and space. The money that best moves value across time, ideally, it's a, it's a money with the least flexible supply, which means the least subject to change. The ideal money then would have a totally inflexible supply. It would not be subject to change whatsoever. So that if I hold a thousand of this unit of currency, and there's only a possible 21 million, I hold a guaranteed fraction of the total money supply forever. No one can ever increase the money supply and debase me or confiscate yeah. wealth from me. So I hold a guaranteed fraction of that total money supply, right? 1,000 out of a possible 21 million units. As the quantity of goods and services goes up in the world, my fraction of the money supply appreciates. Whereas with any, like if, even if this were gold, as the purchasing power of the gold goes up, you're incentivizing more miners to mine, to bring more supply online and to debase other holders of gold. This is true with any commodity. And this is why commodities are ultimately inferior, imperfect forms of money. Yeah. An ideal money would have a fixed supply. Yeah. What is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is the first fixed supply asset in the history of the human race. I think it's the only one we can ever create as well for reasons I won't get into now, but um, yeah, it, basically has a fixed supply of 21 million cannot be altered under any conceivable circumstances. Okay. Perfects the transmission of economic value across time. What about space, right? Gold is really good at time, not space. Well, Bitcoin is purely digital, right? It's just information to hold Bitcoin, you know, quote unquote, hold Bitcoin is to possess a private key which is the, you could think of this as like the password effectively to be able to move funds. Well, you can move information at the speed of light with telecommunications. So I can't imagine being able to move your money across space much more quickly than that. Um, and you can also move it across space without any intermediaries, right? This doesn't need to go through a bank. This doesn't need to go through a financial institution. You can literally send this from person to person. So it's like sliding a gold bag of gold coins across the table, but you can transmit it over the telephone lines. Yeah. Um, so this is, it's a truly radical innovation that we've perfected or nearly perfected this tool that we can transmit economic value perfectly across time because we have a fixed money supply and perfectly across space because it's a fully dematerialized informational money. Um, and I'll pause there. There's a lot of other mind bending things about Bitcoin, but I think that's a pretty useful framing. Yeah, uh, that's fantastic, man. Um, <clears throat> so the you've you've done a fantastic podcast with Preston Pish where you you go into kind of debunking, you know, misconceptions about Bitcoin and some of the the things just that are you know various detractors say about it. So I, I don't want to go into that here. I'm I'm going to link that in the the show notes. Mm -hmm. But could you say just a few words? Um, to differentiate like Bitcoin, not crypto. Like why not Ethereum or Dogecoin or any of these other, the thousands of, of as they're known colloquially in the Bitcoin community, shit coins. Why not them? Yeah, so the key action word here is decentralization. The Bitcoin maximalist viewpoint is that Bitcoin is the only decentralized crypto asset, which means that it is a neutral protocol. There's no 
individual or group that has any disproportionate influence on its development path, on its money supply, on its rules, et cetera. Um, and you could analogize this, maybe more than an, an analogy, really. The internet itself is a stack of these open source protocols. So you've probably heard of HTTP or TCP IP um, or SMTP. These are just pieces of software that are open source. So anyone can inspect, modify, change these things. Yet through this free market process of experimentation, the world has basically standardized onto a few of these things like HTTP, like TCP IP, et cetera. And these become the standard basically, right? They become ossified and standardized as the protocol that everyone uses. You could think of this as like a language in a way. It's like the language everyone speaks. Mm -hmm. So if you want to interact with other, uh, you know, websites today, well, you're going to use the HTTP protocol because that's the one that has all the network effects. That's the one all the other websites are using. And so the internet has sort of evolved organically as a stack of these open source protocols. And it's useful to think of Bitcoin as just the latest evolution in that stack that instead of Bitcoin being an open source protocol for moving information in a way that doesn't require permission, right? It's just someone using software. We can now move actual economic value on the internet mm -hmm. without asking permission, right? We could just literally move money peer to peer, as I described earlier. And so that's, I think, really important to understand that Bitcoin is much more like the internet, whereas all of these other shit coins, as you said, are much more like companies, right? You could, you could say these are, generously, you would say they're liquid venture capital subjected to little, if any, due diligence, meaning they're like startup companies with their own token, but it's so the the bar to start one, it takes 15 minutes on Ethereum to launch your own shit coin. So yeah. there's literally yeah. tens of thousands of these things, right? The bar is so low, there's so little um people aren't actually looking into it. And then the the opportunity to scam people is so high. Because if you can just convince someone that, oh, this token does A, B, and C and they don't get it, because obviously this there's a huge information asymmetry in the space. Yeah. People don't understand, you know, half of the words we're talking about here, you know, decentralization included, that scammers can take advantage of that and conduct what we call innovation theater, right? They can pretend like they're building something really fancy and cool, get you to buy this token, and then they do what's called a rug pull, where they just sell the token, right? You've bought it at a higher and higher price, and they dump it all, and they, you know, leave the investor or customer holding the bag, basically. So less generously, we would say that most of these shit coins are outright scams. Yeah. And I think if you study a little bit of the history, you know, since shit coins came online in like 2000, I think 14 timeframe, over 90% of these things have been outright scams. Yeah. Um, none of them have outperformed Bitcoin over any meaningful time frame. Like yeah, only not, not, even, not even close. <laughs> yeah. And most of them don't last, right? Most of them don't last, you know, more than four years. So that would be the key difference is that, you know, Bitcoin is more like the internet and shit coins are more like startup companies, but with a heavy tendency towards being a scam. <laughs> yeah. So as we say in Bitcoin, well, there's a number of mantras we use. Not your keys, not your coin. If you don't hold your private key, you don't hold your Bitcoin. You hold, you know, if you have Bitcoin on Coinbase, for instance, you have an IOU to Bitcoin. You don't have real Bitcoin. Very common misconception for people. And we also say Bitcoin, not shitcoin, because all of these other shitcoins just don't hold a candle to Bitcoin. And um, even if they succeeded in their market use cases that a lot of them put out, say if all of the tens of thousands succeeded, I don't think it would still equal even a fifth of Bitcoin's total addressable market, right? Bitcoin's competing to be global money. 
Yeah. All the other use cases combined for these shit coins would be less than 20% of Bitcoin's total addressable market. And that assumes that they're all successful. That assumes that they overcome all of these technical challenges. Um, and Bitcoin doesn't need to do any of that. It just needs to do what it's been doing perfectly for the past 15 years. So on a risk reward basis, Bitcoin is just the obvious choice. Yeah, fantastic. <clears throat> so Robert, you've been you've been doing your podcast for over three years now. You've got over 420 episodes. Um, what has changed in your life for the better now that you know more about what money actually is? Um, I, you know, I don't know if this is, it's hard to say whether it's, I mean, I guess it's a product of knowledge and a product of having Bitcoin as a tool, but this, this is pretty common with a lot of people you tend to start saving a lot more once you start interacting with Bitcoin because, well, guess what? You've got a tool that works, right? Yeah. Unless you were burying gold in your backyard or collecting physical gold, that worked pretty decent as savings, but it's pretty impractical, right? If you move house or you want to spend some of it or, you know, it's just tricky to secure. A lot of people aren't going to play that game of let me dig a hole in my backyard and bury gold or put gold in the safe. It's just less useful, less practical for people. But Bitcoin gives you that same effect, but and it's something that's very practical, very easy to use. So once you start engaging with Bitcoin, most people tend to become great savers, frankly. And I'm, you know, I've always saved. I've always been a little bit on the, conservative side you know i have like a finance and accounting background so i've always saved money but bitcoin has definitely thrown gas on that fire like you really cannot get enough sats <laughs> um and the purchasing power goes up or has gone up tremendously over four year periods historically and there's a strange thing about this too now if you read the book the bitcoin standard you would learn about this concept called time preference and time preference basically means it's a little bit counterintuitive for people, but the lower your time preference, the less concerned you are with immediate satisfaction. You basically have a longer time horizon, right? Lower time preference equals longer time horizon. And you start to become more interested in timeless things. Like you start, a lot of, this is also common among Bitcoiners. A lot of Bitcoiners stop drinking. They start working out. They start settling down. They start making families. They start going to church. Like all of these traditional values seem to come back into, into people's lives. And it's, I mean, it sounds like a jump. You're like, what do you mean? You had a good savings technology, so you found God? Like what, what are you talking about? But I don't know, like the proofs in the pudding, right? You can go spend some time with Bitcoiners and you'll see it happening. And this is at a time, by the way, when all of these trends are going the opposite direction in the rest of the world, right? People are going to church less, getting married less, having less children, less life satisfaction, blah, 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 blah. But in the Bitcoin world, it's the opposite. I don't know exactly why. I mean, I guess you could attribute it to lowering time preference. I have definitely experienced that. It's hard for me to disentangle whether that's, you know, my studying, my my podcast journey, like that itself could be considered um, an expression of lower time preference too. Like I've always been someone interested in reading. I've always been someone that likes to, to exercise, for instance. But since getting into Bitcoin, I'm doing it more than ever. Like I, I've given up drinking. I've I work out more than ever. I'm more disciplined about that. I'm more disciplined about my health. I'm more disciplined about my diet. I'm more disciplined about my reading, my writing, et cetera. So I don't know. I think it just all around makes you a better person. And if it were just me, then I would think maybe this sounds totally crazy. But when I go to these conferences and I spend time with Bitcoiners, I'm surrounded by people experiencing the same thing. Like obviously not all the same, but everyone has kind of the same flavor. It's like, you know, I'm a person, I had some good things about me and some bad things about me. I got into Bitcoin. I learned a lot of new things and had to unlearn a lot of other things. And on net, I've become a better person. You know, I'm, I've stopped doing the bad. I'm doing less of the bad things and more of the good things. Yeah, pretty much. 
and that's i don't know it's mind-blowing it's really really cool <laughs> um sounds maybe too good to be true but i would challenge you to uh go to some of these bitcoin events and engage with bitcoin yourself and see if it works for you too yeah absolutely <clears throat> okay so if you could go back in time you know just before you started this journey which i you were you were about 19 you said when you first read the creature from jekyll island yeah that's right um then you had you know like 30 seconds to to tell yourself something before you got sucked back into the the you know the, oh. the wormhole what would you what would you tell yourself you know whether it was a warning or uh just yeah what would you say to yourself before before you got brought back oh my goodness okay so buy bitcoin that's an easy <laughs> one all right um because then i would have probably bought bitcoin in 2000 then and uh, you know everyone wishes they got it earlier let's just put it that way yeah i would also say i've gone through and they're like the reason i'm wearing this ridiculous outfit today is because of an emf protective gear basically mm -hmm. and i have wi-fi in my office it's getting removed tomorrow but i was, said we would do this podcast today so we're doing it today so i dressed up looking like a jedi um <laughs> i this is because I've been on a long health journey, actually. Like I've gone through some digestive issues and I've had to learn, like it's this whole puzzle of like how to eat, what to eat, what not to eat. As you get yeah. older, it's been a real challenging cognitive journey, like frustrating, right? You think you figure yeah. one thing out. It's like trying to plug the dam, you know, you plug two holes and another leak spouts over here and you, it's just been a whole puzzle. Yeah. So I think I would tell myself to look into keto carnivore diet uh you know take your health seriously in my 20s i just burned the candle at both ends i worked hard and played hard you know didn't bother me in my 20s but caught up caught up to me in my 30s so i could probably save myself a lot of uh a lot of heartache if i could transmit a message backwards to myself about that and um yeah, I would also say start having kids sooner. And like that's the, that is the meaning of life as far as I can tell is 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 making a family and I've come to this point I don't know if this is the product of my age or bitcoin or what but the only thing I want to do in life anymore is make some beautiful people and build some valuable businesses. Like yeah. I don't really know what else to do, you know. Yeah. It's it's people helping people basically. It's kind of like the meaning of life is is my mantra there because, you know, obviously being a parent, you're helping people become people, and then building valuable businesses, you're helping people solve problems. So those are the messages I would send back to myself. Yeah, Robert, I think that's a beautiful place to end. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much for just the the work that you've done building up. You know the the What Is Money show and the just the I know you probably got a thousand hours into <laughs> podcast episodes alone. Um, yeah. Is, is there anything that you'd like to, you know, leave listeners with uh, before we sign off? No, I mean, thank you to for having me. This has been a really fun conversation. I'm, I'm glad you've gotten some value out of it. And yeah, we're, I don't know, over 420 something episodes. So I don't know. We're probably pushing that thousand hour mark. Yeah. Um, and it's just yeah i'm very grateful like i get i'm a nerd at heart if it's not obvious <laughs> and i get to nerd out for a living so i'm very grateful that i get to do what i love and help people in the process so I feel very very grateful about that um i would just point people to the podcast website what is money podcast.com and then my biggest social media platform is twitter or x now and you can find me at breedlove22, B-R-E-E-D-L-O-V-E-2-2. Awesome. Thanks so much, man. Take care. Thanks, man.